Well, good morning or good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. We're really glad to have you join us today for an exciting discussion on the recent Indian state elections. My name is Catherine Hada. I'm a senior visiting fellow with the U.S. India Policy Studies Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. So we're going to look today at what just happened with the Indian state elections, um, the dynamics, uh, where the parties are, what this all means for U.S.-India relations, and also uh, what future policies the states are likely to see as a result of these elections, and how all this also plays into India's own national elections next year. And I couldn't have asked for a better panel to join me here today to discuss these important issues. Uh, we have Milan Vashnav, the Senior Fellow and Director of the South Asia Program of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Bhuvna Anand, Co-Founder of Prosperity in India, and Sadhanan Dume, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. So welcome to all of you. Um, just as a bit of background, uh, as most of our viewers doubtless know, uh, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Telangana, Mizoram just had their state legislative elections. Uh, the BJP arrested control back in Chhattisgarh and Rajasthan, and won in Madhya Pradesh um, in at least two of those cases with a larger majority than one would have expected to see. Congress won in Telangana, um, against the incumbent BRS, a local party um, that has ruled that state uh, since its formation in 2014. So some big changes. So I'm going to ask Milan to kick us off. Can you explain in more granularity what just happened with the elections? Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone. And thank you, um, Kathy. I'm just going to share my screen and show a couple of slides. If that's okay, um, let me just make this full screen. Can you see that okay, Kathy? Yes, it looks great. Okay, <clears throat> perfect. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, I have maybe the easiest job of my fellow, fellow panelists uh, to just kind of go over some of the, the, the highlights of, of these elections. Uh, and as Catherine mentioned, um, they were quite remarkable and provided the uh, ruling party at the center of the BJP, of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, a, a real boost. Uh, the BJP swept the Hindi heartland states, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan, uh, while the Congress won just one of five elections, um, winning the southern state of Telangana for the first. Oh. Results from the northeastern state of Misoram. Um, which was won by a new regional front, which is actually a coalition of six uh, political parties, um, ousting uh, the incumbent, the Miso National Front. And so what I thought I would do is just quickly go through uh, just the, the numbers, starting with Chhattisgarh. Um, I should mention that um, if you go back to the 2018 assembly elections, the Congress party uh, picked up all three of these Hindi heartland states, uh, Chhattisgarh, MP, and in, in Rajasthan. Um, uh, in Chhattisgarh, uh, the Congress uh, really swept that election uh, in, in the assembly polls in 2018. And you can see that there was just a, a pretty stark reversal of fortune. Uh, uh, the, out of 90 seats in the assembly, uh, the BJP won a clear majority with 54. Uh, the Congress uh, gave up 33 seats relative to its 2018 performance. This was an election, as, as Catherine alluded to, that uh, most uh, exit polls suggested was going to be close. If you talk to people within the Congress party, uh, they thought that they would retain Chhattisgarh, not necessarily by a large majority, but certainly by a slim one. And we see, in fact, um, that did not happen at all. So this was a significant uh, a pickup and a blow both for the Congress as well as the, the Chief Minister Bhupendra Bagel uh, of the Congress. Uh, in Madhya Pradesh, um, we had an interesting result in 2018. This was a state that was won by the Congress. The Congress formed the government there, although it did not last very long. There was a pretty significant defection from the now union minister, Jyotir Aditya Sindhya, who was a longtime congressman who defected. 
He joined the BJP. He's currently uh, the Union Civil Aviation Minister. Uh, that defection essentially changed the numbers in the assembly. The BJP was able to then cobble together a majority. Um, so they were the incumbent heading into this election. Um, and, and you can see that uh, the BJP uh, trounced uh, the Congress. Um, the, the Madhya Pradesh has been ruled for most of the last two decades by one man, the BJP Chief Minister Shivraj Singh Chauhan. Um, uh, notably, the BJP did not project Mr. Chauhan as their chief ministerial face. So there's some question looking ahead as to whether or not he will return. Uh, with these numbers, it's going to be pretty hard to deny him uh, uh, another term, but we're still waiting to hear um, how the BJP is, is going to handle its leadership in all of these states. And then coming to Rajasthan, here is a state uh, that was ruled by, by the Congress once again, by the incumbent kind of war horse of, of the Congress, Ashok Gelot, uh, who invested quite a lot in pretty lavish welfare schemes in an attempt to uh, sort of grease the wheels uh, and, and generate popular support. Uh, in the end, that did not work out for him. Uh, the Congress lost 30 seats, bringing its tally down to 70, and the BJP uh, won 42 seats, uh, giving it uh, a clear majority in Rajasthan. Rajasthan is a state that many had expected to uh, switch hands. Uh, if you go back over the past several election cycles, it is one of these states that every five years, uh, like clockwork, seems to switch hands between the Congress and the BJP. So I, I would say in some sense, this is probably the least uh, surprising result, uh, particularly when you compare it to uh, the two states that we've, we've just talked about. Um, there was an important southern state uh, that went to polls, the, uh, the state of Telangana, uh, where we did see an upset, an upset that I think was largely predicted um, since 2014, when the state was carved out of what was then undivided Andhra Pradesh. Uh, the state has been ruled by one party known as the TRS. Uh, they've changed their name now to the BRS. Uh, led by the former chief minister, K. Chandrasekhar Rao. Um, they had an uninterrupted 10-year rule in Telangana. That has now come to an end. Uh, the Congress party uh, is uh, earned a clear majority with 65 seats out of an assembly of 119. Uh, they just announced that the leader and the kind of face of the Congress campaign, uh, Ravantha Reddy, is going to be uh, the new chief minister of that state. He's a sort of younger, dynamic figure, uh, somebody that we haven't heard a lot about on, on the national stage. The BJP uh, picked up seats. Uh, historically, they have been a minor player in most southern states, save for, for Karnataka. Uh, they did pick up four parliamentary seats in the state last time. So uh, this performance uh, suggests that um, they still retain uh, a base of uh, support, although nothing uh, on the order of either the Congress uh, or the BRS. Coming now to the fifth state of Misaram, um, which is a uh, much smaller northeastern state, uh, the incumbent Miso National Front, which is a regional party, lost. Uh, and a party that people thought might be the sort of kingmaker, but not necessarily the king itself, uh, the ZPM, uh, the Zoram People's Movement, which I said before is a kind of uh, coalition of six uh, regional parties, uh, 127 seats uh, with, with a clear majority. Both the BJP and the Congress have been uh, a, a pretty minor kind of bit players in, in this state. So their relatively lackluster performance was not really uh, notable. Um, it was it was largely on unexpected lines, right? So you have a clean sweep for the BJP in the Hindi heartland, a pickup for the Congress in the state of Telangana, and then uh, a regional party, uh, a bagging Misaram. Uh, this is uh, a, a graphic from the Hindustan Times that I've just reproduced here, showing um, essentially what political control of India's uh, states has looked like over time. And you can see now with these elections that have just taken place, uh, the BJP controls 12 states on its own. It is part of the ruling coalition in another six states. So there are 18 states that belong to the NDA or the National Democratic Alliance. Uh, the Congress tally is at three, uh, while they retain power 
as as minor coalition partners in in three other states. This is basically where uh, the country was back in in 2021. As you could see, the the sort of numbers there are are, are virtually identical. And what's notable about this map is you you, you really come to see. The two great sort of strongholds now uh, of the BJP in some sense. So the traditional catchment area of kind of north, central and, and western Gujarat, uh, depicted here by, by by the state of Gujarat. Of course, it's in the government in Maharashtra. Uh, and then since Modi's come to power, uh, it has become a real force. Uh, in the Northeast, and you can see uh, quite a bit of orange in those places, relatively uh, weaker coverage in the South and in the in the in the kind of Eastern corridor uh, of India. Uh, these elections are going to be billed as they always are uh, get, uh, as semifinals for the 2024 general election, which we expect will take place in April and May over a period of six or so weeks. Um, that's not entirely true. Uh, if you look at the chart here, this shows uh, what happened in these same states in the 2018 assembly elections, and then how those states voted just six months later in the 2019 Lok Sabha elections. And you can see, as I mentioned before, in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, the Congress did very well in the assembly elections, which, which fueled a lot of optimism in the party and among the opposition that they would uh, use that as a springboard to sweep or at least make a, a considerable dent uh, in the BJP's tally in those three states. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, all of those bluish bars turn to orange uh, in the Lok Sabha elections. Um, so this idea of the state assembly elections acting as a kind of semifinal uh, is not really true. Having said that, uh, I would wager that it is more likely to be true this time uh, because uh, the BJP really benefits from the fact that Modi is, quote unquote, on the ballot in, 2000, in 2024 in national polls. Right. So um, to the extent that there are people who would like to vote for the BJP in national elections in order to retain kind of Modi's uh, uh, position as prime minister, um, we could actually see some of these results replica, repeat themselves in 2019. Um, I would be much more skeptical um, if the Congress did well in these states that they would be able to repeat those feats. Uh, it's just six months from now in, in the state assembly polls. Uh, these elections are also important, I just want to add, because, of course, it is states that determine the composition of the upper house, known as the Rajya Sabha, the Council of States. Um, members of the upper house are indirectly elected by members of the their respective state legislatures. And while the BJP has earned two consecutive single party majorities in the lower house of parliament, the Lok Sabha, uh, they have yet to uh, reach uh, the majority mark in, in the upper house, the Rajya Sabha. Uh, so the only way you can really change the composition of the Rajya Sabha, of course, is if you win more states. Um, so this is going to uh, eventually over time lead to a greater BJP presence. Uh, of course, these numbers underestimate the strength of the BJP in the in the upper house, because, of course, they do have alliance partners, which are part of the NDA coalition uh, that, of course, vote with the BJP. But they've also come to rely in a pretty uh, consistent fashion on a number of smaller, technically unaffiliated or independent parties, which for one reason or another have on big ticket items uh, sided with the BJP when it comes to important votes uh, in the Rajya Sabha. Uh, this is just a, an interesting data point that was pointed out uh, by, by the data team in the Hindustan Times. I just wanted to, uh, to, to flag that I was not aware of uh, until it was put in this stark form, which is that there has not been a single Congress state government which has been reelected in the Modi era. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think the last Congress state government to win re-election was, um, was the Congress government in Assam, uh, which was back in 2011, right? So uh, while the Congress has occasionally won new states, as it won Telangana, it has a pretty abysmal track record of actually holding on to states, right? So we talk a lot about anti-incumbency, uh, in Indian politics, and it looks like, at least when we're con when concerned about the state level, that anti-incumbency has uh, affected the Congress differentially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the BJP. Um, 
you know, maybe I'll just sort of end uh, on this. I realize this chart is, is maybe a little bit difficult to read, so I'll just try to break it down very quickly. The question is sort of what happens now to the opposition? There are more than two dozen parties which have decided to contest elections under the banner of the Indian National Developmental Inclusive Alliance, which is a handful, but of course, the acronym for that alliance is India, which some people find very trite, some people find very clever, depending on, on, on where you, uh, how you see it. The Congress uh, defeats, and, and pretty significant defeats, I think are certainly going to decrease the amount of leverage that the party has as it enters into negotiations with its fellow alliance partners as they look towards uh, negotiating the very complex dance of seat sharing uh, ahead of the 2024 election. So we've already seen just in the past couple of days, other regional parties say this wasn't a defeat for the people. This wasn't really a defeat for the opposition. It was a defeat for the Congress. Um, and so you can expect a lot of pushback when this alliance meets uh, in Mumbai on December 6th, uh, which is uh, tomorrow, I guess, as a matter of fact. Um, I think the alliance is a pretty far ways off from seat sharing. I think they've got quite a lot of preparatory work to do. Um, but I think the Congress is certainly entering in, into those negotiations um, from a much more disadvantaged position. Um, I think we're going to talk about what this might mean for U.S.-India ties later. Uh, so maybe I'll just stop here, Catherine, and, and turn it over to my uh, fellow panelists. Thank you so much, Milan. That was really an excellent overview. Um, and I hadn't realized that about Congress and not being reelected in any state either. It's really striking. Um, Bhuvanak, given that um, states really do have a lot of leeway in setting their own policies, uh, particularly in areas like job creation, trade and investment, health, education, um, it's sort of striking. You know, one of the comments uh, that I've been reading is that um, Congress didn't have an overriding vision, and that was one of the reasons the BJP did so well. But can 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 we say that for sure? I mean, how much really um, can we attribute to the individual policies of states, noting um, that even a BJP state may not implement all the national policies um, that it, it should be implementing? So uh, how does all this play out in the ground, in your view? Great question. I think I have uh, the second easiest job after Milan, because all I have to say is policy continuity. Uh, and that sort of sums up uh, what's going on and what we can roughly expect. Just for context, Catherine, I want to put some facts out there, right? Uh, three out of five states that have gone into elections account for about 17% of India's population and about 15% of the GDP, right? So just for, for perspective of how big or how small and the footprint is, um, three out of these five states, that's Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, uh, sorry, Telangana, uh, are um, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Telangana are among the 10 largest economies in the country, right? We've got 28 plus five economies within India. Um, but only one of these states features among the top 10 exporting states, and that's Telangana, which is where some of this stuff becomes interesting because Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Mizoram is a much smaller state, and th there are many more complexities in northeastern states. So I will refer a little less to uh, Mizoram than to the other four states. Um, the GDP growth, interestingly, in all of these states, or at least in the four states, has been higher than an all India average for the last few years. So in some ways, even with different governments, you're seeing that states are racing uh, towards this economic growth vision, um, irrespective of who the ruling party is. So in some ways, you're also seeing a break between manifestos or the declarative, uh, you know, sort of more populist uh, uh, posturing that, and uh, what's going on once they take reins in the state. Uh, a few sort of things that stood out to me uh, in preparation for this lecture, I went back and looked at the party manifestos uh, in all of the states, save Mizoram. Uh, I wasn't able to do that. Um, but at least in the heartland states, I think your intuition that the overarching vision is thinner in the case of Congress party manifestos is right. Um, it's not so much that, uh, you know, they, they all say very similar things ultimately. That being said, the way it is presented is very different. Uh, one of the things that jumped out at me when I saw the party manifestos of the BJP uh, in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh is the use of facts and accomplishments 
right? Uh, both of the central uh, of the union government, but also of the state government. So bringing these two things together. The repeated features that are uh, occurring in the manifestos of three, or the themes that are occurring, if you will, at least in the case of uh, the BJP, is farmers, uh, and that also poses an eventual challenge in terms of policy for us. Uh, women is the one that I think stands out to everybody, the amount of emphasis uh, on women-related policies, uh, infrastructure, and the last is economic growth. In all three states, there is a promising of a target. So just to give you an example, in Rajasthan, it's $350 billion economy in the next five years. Uh, then there is the doubling of per capita income, which is there in all three states. Uh, there is the promise of you know 24-7 electricity. Infrastructure is a repeat uh, theme that comes up as well. Um, and this sort of uh, is very different than the con Congress manifesto. So there are elements that are common that are pre present in both, which are social protection, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, a lot of what you might phrase as populist policies, if you will, or uh, freebie politics, if you will. But in the BJP manifestos, there's a supplementing with this economic growth agenda uh, in, in several different uh, parts and ways. I want to switch to what does this mean for once the new administration sort of take uh, take office. Um, for the last few years, we've been hearing this phrase a lot, uh, double engine ki sarkar, uh, for the audience that may speak in Hindi, which basically is the BJP's sort of uh, uh, approach that says, well, elect us at the union and elect us at the center, and you will get a double powered government. Right. And in some ways that uh, seems to play out or that is one potential promise that you are able to see. So now, given that the union elections are just about five, six months away, uh, we're looking at a five year continuity window in at least three of these states. Telangana is, uh, you know, sort of, of course, at a different uh, uh, will play out differently. Uh, what this could potentially mean, the union government has had a fiscal consolidation roughly you know, on the agenda. Right. And with the run up to the elections, there was some fear that uh, populism would take over. My sense is with this, at least in these three states, you will see a calming of that and potentially, uh, you know, continue. You, you won't see as many crazy announcements that, as you might expect or as you might predict. Right. So there will be that helps uh, the broader national economy. Uh, let me talk a little bit about specific states and what they've promised and where uh, where they might depart or continue or what they might need to do. Uh, in India, the, the constitution vests states with rulemaking powers uh, through the idea of lists. Uh, the union government has purview on a bunch of items in the union list subject. The state governments and the union government share power on what's called concurrent list subjects. And then there are state list subjects. In the states where the union government and the state governments uh, uh, come from the same party or from the same alliance, on concurrent list subjects, you're potentially seeing some kind of policy match. Let me give you some examples, right? Uh, labor regulation is one such area where typically, I mean, over the last many years, there have been conversation that India needs to reform its labor laws. And that's sort of been stuck. Uh, agriculture is another area where it's been stuck, uh, but potentially now that there is some consonance, you may see, uh, you know, sort of uh, some liberalization, uh, more market oriented policies coming out, or at least not being, um, you know, sort of dissonant with each other, right, at, at, any, at any rate. Uh, a few headlines that, uh, a few other headlines that stood out at me. Uh, the first is on this question of uh, economic growth and doubling incomes and these specific targets. So as you know, in the last few years, many states during elections and immediately after have made declarative uh, economic growth targets. For example, Uttar Pradesh set up the one trillion mission. Um, Maharashtra at some point had set up the one trillion dollar mission. Uh, you're going to see similar things in at least three states. Uh, and that would be interesting to see because now you have um, with the investor summits, with the, uh, you know, sort of conversations with several, um, you know, trying to roll out the red carpet. Uh, there is a lot of that kind of federal competition. It'll be interesting to see how these states, which share uh, a political party, compete with each other for really the same pool of investments, both to be able to specialize, but also to be able to set yourself apart. Now, Telangana has always been interesting because it is one of the um, leaders 
in the IT BPM services area in India, right? And it's historically made its mark, Hyderabad, for example, you're no stranger to it, uh, Catherine. Um, and so in some way, um, what happens in the other states? Here we have a bit of a challenge, which is at least Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, or at least Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh are largely agricultural states. Madhya Pradesh, with, even with its economic aims, part of the challenge is that uh, that it, most of its exports, for example, are primary product exports, right? Chhattisgarh, most of its work is around mining or mining adjacent industry, right? Um, similarly with Rajasthan, a third of Rajasthan is under uh, uh, agriculture. Now, how will you make this transition from farm to factories in these three states? If you want to be in the top three, in fact, I think Madhya Pradesh says, uh, that they aim to be in the top three economies in the country. Now, if that's going to be the case, you're you're going to compete with uh, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu, and Telangana, right? Uh, and Andhra Pradesh. Those are the top five in some ways. And so how are you going to upseed them? Because you are at a third of where Maharashtra is uh, in terms of your GDP. So there's some amount of, there's a significant amount of catching up to do. And that catching up can't uh, uh, can't go, can't be business as usual. So that some kind of destabilization, some kind of uh, radical step towards changing things is necessary. And in some ways, it's a no-brainer. What will they have to change? They will have to change labor regulation. They will have to change a whole bunch of land and land use regulation. And these are going to be tricky in agriculture states, right? Land acquisition is a problem. Land transfers are a problem. Problem and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of that kind of attachment. Uh, and uh, it's not clear to me uh, how you break that uh, log jam to go from farms to factories. Uh, I want to point to sort of three common challenges uh, that I also foresee, and I'm not clear how states solve this. Um, the first is electricity and power. Um, on the one hand, we know the state of you know finances as far as electricity goes, the debt-ridden discoms, the you know inability to be able to deliver uh, consistent, reliable power at least to industry, the cross subsidization. These are familiar challenges. However, if you look at the poll promises, there is also both the BJP's promises as well as the Congress's promises. Uh, there is a lot of free electricity on the cards, uh, and a lot of very very cheap electricity. More of uh, how are we going to finance this? Where is this going to come from? And you can't keep kicking the can down the road. So at what point are we going to be able to solve this problem? It remains a real question for me. Uh, I'll give you some examples, right? I think in Rajasthan, it is uh, rupees um, saw may saw unit bijli, which basically means 100 rupees for 100 units of electricity, right? Uh, 200 free units in uh, another state and so on and so forth. So this is a repeat feature that's that's coming up. The second is that agriculture is in trouble. Uh, all parties, irrespective of shade, uh, are going out of their way to continue the, you know, sort of previous policies on agriculture, some of which we have tried to jettison as, a, you know, as recently as uh, 2017, 2018, right? Um, and, but we are back to increasing, uh, providing MSP bonuses. We are back to, uh, you know, guaranteeing purchase. We're back to expanding the procurement system from wheat and rice to other grains in Mizoram, interestingly, to also other, uh, you know, sort of perishables like ginger, turmeric, chili, and so on. Um, and how, how are we going to manage that? Because at some point, we've got to bring the negotiating parties to the table and have a conversation about unknotting the political economy around agriculture. It's not clear to me that uh, that this can happen, but I suspect that give this double engine Sarkar may give us the opportunity, given that all of these are state or concurrent list subjects. Um, so there is some, you know, sort of uh, uh, interesting um, developments I feel in the offing post the union elections next year. And the last thing is this question of the old pension scheme. Uh, if you recall, this is the big thing that came up from Rajasthan and was part of uh, uh, the promise. Um, this the, the jury is out on what this does to you know the fiscal balance in a state and uh, whether the, the BJP has largely been non-committal about this. So it's not clear whether they will go back. There is an expert committee constituted and so on. That being said, is there pressure? To revert to the old pension scheme and that has large ramifications for many many states um, who are coming up for elections in the next you know sort of uh, many months um so all in all i suspect that there is some policy continuity that you can expect 
Um, there is uh, there are some pending questions that I'm not sure are easily resolvable, but perhaps this, at least in three out of five states, there is a window of opportunity if governments are willing to take some risks or at least begin to negotiate. And third, uh, uh, there is um, a big emphasis on economic growth and infrastructure, which I hope will, uh, you know, force a reckoning on um, liberalizing at the state level. Uh, I will stop my comments there and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Very, very excellent summation and thought provoking. I think Milan had also noted that welfare stops in themselves aren't necessarily a vote getter. So it's interesting to have the bigger uh, picture. And also, you know, I think there's a lot of talk that uh, India is getting sort of bifurcated with the um, orange map, you know, top and uh, and the uh, wealthier states at the bottom and the fastest growing, more populous states at the top. So you've created, I think, an intriguing alternate scenario of uh, economic growth in the middle that could really help even that out and maybe reduce some social tensions. Um, Sadhanam, we're going to go to you now for the question that I think is on a lot of people's minds, uh, which is what all this means uh, for next year's national elections. Um, I do want to uh, tell people one person has already asked a question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to do that. We will take questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Excellent. Well, well, well thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks quite limited here. And uh, I want to make sort of four uh, broad points, two of which I think, you know, Milan had already touched upon, so I won't dwell upon them at length. Uh, the first point is that these particular state elections are an imperfect predictor of national elections that usually follow closely. Uh, the second point is that nonetheless, and Milan said this too, um, they do suggest strongly that Modi is in the catbird seat for re-election. Um, I'll explain some of the reasons in uh, in more detail. My third point is that Congress now faces very serious questions about the path ahead. And uh, unfortunately for Congress, does not have a lot of time to come up with answers. And the fourth point is that the idea that you see uh, on social media put forth by some people that uh, the the victory of Congress in Telangana and the fact that the BJP now is not in, not in power in any of the five states, the idea that this means that there is going to be a BJP free, BJP free South, um, in my view, is uh, overly simplistic. So let me take the first of that those first, which is that why this particular set of elections, and by that I mean Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, and Madhya Pradesh, um, as they are an imperfect sort of um, indicator of what follows in national elections. Um, going back twenty years, uh, if you go back twenty years in uh, in two thousand and eighteen, Congress won all three, and uh, BJP nonetheless ended up uh, winning the national elections and, in fact, improving its position. In 2013, the BJP won all three, and in that year, it was a good sort of, you know, indicator because then the Modi subsequently went on to win the national election in 2014. In 2008, the BJP won two out of three, but uh, which was Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, but nonetheless, it didn't do very well in the Lok Sabha elections of 2009. And back in 2003, and this is the most famous um, of those sort of, you know, predictions gone wrong. Um, the BJP had again won all three. It led Atal Bihari Vajpayee to to move up the national elections, confident of winning in 2004. And of course, we all know that Congress came back into power in 2004. So over the past 20 years, if you look at this, uh, basically in three out of the last of the four uh, elections that we've had over the last 24 years, um, these three states have been a uh, negative bellwether, in fact. Uh, the party that has won those has ended up not prevailing in national elections. Nonetheless, I agree with uh, Millen that this time around, it strongly suggests that uh, Modi is in the driver's seat heading for re-election, which, by the way, would make him the first prime minister since Jawaharlal Nehru to win three consecutive uh, national elections. Uh, which is sort of, you know, a staggering feat, which basically means that he, if should he prevail in national elections, 
uh, would have done something that uh, nobody, not even Indira Gandhi, was able to do before him. Now, why am I? Why do I think that you know, reading the tea leaves, and all, you know, with all the usual caveats, of course, I could be proven wrong and have egg on my face six months from now. Um, but why do I feel that Modi is in a in a dominant position? First of all, it's not just that these uh, state elections show that he continues to have a very powerful hold um, on voters, particularly in the in the Hindi heartland. Uh, there's also polling that shows that, you know, for example, the Morning Consult polling, which looks at 22 leaders around the world, it shows that Modi's approval rating is 77 percent, which is by far the highest domestic approval rating of any of the 22 leaders that they that they track. Uh, the BJP enjoys an overwhelming funding advantage, and this is something that Mellon has written about a, a fair bit. But if you look at the you know, Association of Democratic Reforms report, uh, between 2017 and 2022, the BJP declared had three times more declared funding than all other national parties combined. So that gives you a kind of sense of just how much sort of how much better funded the BJP is. And with these elections sort of signaling that they're going to remain in power, I imagine that that advantage is going to grow even uh, even greater, notwithstanding the fact that Congress has now got control of Hyderabad, which is a very important and uh, more importantly, in terms from 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 an electoral funding funding point of view, uh, a, a kind of cash rich city like Hyderabad. Nonetheless, I would say that the BJP advantage is huge and is likely to continue to view to, to grow. Uh, uh, another factor that sort of leans towards the BJP is that, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, Hindu nationalism has really become the dominant ideology across uh, across across much of India. Uh, there are relatively few takers for the kind of, you know, old fashioned Congress brand of secularism and a large number of people who are, you know, 18 years old who be voting in the, in the in the coming election would have been just, you know, eight years old when Modi first took uh, first took power. So for many people, this is the only sort of, you know, uh, the, the only prime minister they've known. And he's an extremely sort of dom do, uh, dominant figure. And then finally, I'd add to that fact that the BJP has a very a largely sympathetic media, particularly in the news channels and a kind of larger ecosystem, including on social media, which, you know, is, is, is quite dominant. So if you take all of these things together um, and then place these sort of, you know, these, these state elections in perspective, uh, it seems very clear that it's advantage BJP. Now, for Congress, uh, this raises, you know, serious questions. Uh, the most sort of important setback for Congress in this is that it has sort of resurrected the idea, uh, resurrected questions about uh, Rahul Gandhi's effectiveness as a campaigner. Uh, the Congress hope had been that the combination of the Bharat Jodo Yatra, where Rahul Gandhi late last year and earlier this year, early this year, Rahul Gandhi and uh, various Congress uh, workers and people in the public had, you know, walked. Rahul Gandhi apparently walked about four thousand kilometers starting late last year into early this year uh, across the length of India. And among a lot of Congress supporters and well-wishers, there was a hope that this would finally put to rest any idea that Rahul Gandhi was not cut out for the, for the cutthroat competition of Indian politics. And then they got good news in May when Congress you know, scored a comprehensive victory in Karnataka. Um, what this has done here, this sort of 3-1 defeat, is that it's sort of raise those questions again. Does he have the right instincts, both in terms of messaging and in terms of uh, picking the right advisors and so on? So a, a story that a storyline that Congress would have hoped had been buried has been has been resurrected. And it raises questions going ahead. So, for example, the idea that he sort of, you know, uh, put forward quite, you know, uh, quite aggressively, this idea of Jitni Abadi Utni Haq, which basically means that uh, my best understanding of it is that he's implying that uh, jobs and education should be uh, uh, access to jobs and education should be allocated uh, proportionally uh, based on the numbers of various caste groups. And this was backed by this promise of a caste census. Uh, obviously, that has fallen flat uh, in these three Hindi heartland states. The question really now is that should will the con should the Congress double down on this? Or should I should it abandon this as sort of some you know strategy that's not really working? Um, the other big question that they're going to continue to grapple with is should they embrace what uh, many commentators refer to as soft Hindutva, 
which is sort of you know appealing to you know uh, public displays of relig- religiosity to appeal to Mus- to to Hindu voters. Or should they sort of retreat from this because this is not going to help them in any case because the BJP is clearly identified as the pro-Hindu party? And is the Congress better off kind of retreating to a more kind of uh, Nehruvian secularist position? Um, again, this is a sort of ongoing debate. They're not going to have much time to, to, uh, time to settle this. And then finally, you know, how are they going to launch a credible national campaign? Whereas Millen mentioned, they're only in power in three states, and you know, and sort of, I guess, tangentially, sort of, sort of, sort of involved in government in another three. Whereas for the BJP, that number, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is, is 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 18. So the mismatch over here, right, sort of David versus Goliath syndrome, uh, has been heightened. And then you also have to take into account the fact that now you know, the the, the con- Congress is coming into this on the back of two really serious drubbings, right, both in 2014 and in 2019. So if there's sort of a boxing match, um, how much more of a pummeling are they going to be able to take and still keep standing? Uh, my fourth and final point is this idea of, uh, you know, the BJP Free South. And, you know, on the face of it, it does make sort of a certain amount of sense. The BJP is not in power in any of the five uh, southern states, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, uh, Karnataka, Kerala, or, or Tamil Nadu. Uh, and it does not look like it has serious prospects of coming to power in any of those states, except for Karnataka, where it has been a major player and it's been in and out of government regularly. In the other four, they've sort of, you know, it's not really much of a contender. Um, that being said, you know, if you peel back the data a little bit, you would sort of, uh, many people would be surprised to know that in 2019, in fact, the BJP won more seats in southern India than the Congress did. Uh, the BJP won 29 seats on those five states. Congress won only 27 st- seats. Uh, it's true, of course, that those BJP 29 seats came from only two states. 25 of them came from Karnataka, and uh, four of them came from Telangana, whereas the BJP was not able to win a single state, a single seat in Andhra Pradesh, uh, Kerala, or Tamil Nadu. Um, nonetheless, I think the sort of more accurate way of looking at this is not to say that the BJP he, that, the, that the South will be free of the BJP, but to point out that two things. One, that the BJP will depend much less on the South than Congress does, right? So those 29 seats that BJP won in the South in 2019 basically came to less than 10% of their total seats because they won 303 Lok Sabha seats. Whereas the 27 seats that Congress won from those same five Southern states uh, accounted for more than half of the total seats they won. So I think the sort of, you know, what, what's pertinent over here is not the idea that, that, the, that the South is going to be BJP free, especially not in Lok Sabha elections. Um, many people would have noticed that the BJP upped its uh, vote share uh, fairly significantly in, uh, in Telangana. So I think, you know, and they, they, they'd won, I believe, four seats in, two, in 2019. I imagine that they would sort of probably position them to uh, you know, do reasonably well in Telangana in the Lok Sabha election uh, again in, tw- in, in in next year. And of course, Karnataka is an old stronghold of theirs. Um, so it's less, sort of less a question of, you know, the, of the South being uh, free of the BJP in, in, in the context of the Lok Sabha and more a question of the Congress party becoming really overly dependent on uh, one part of the country that uh, does not supply as many seats, obviously, as the Hindi heartland. And if there is delimitation going ahead, that is likely to shrink further. And that, I think, raises another sort of, you know, uh, really big question mark over the long-term future and prospects of the Congress Party. But I'll leave it over there. Thanks. Okay, well, that was really an excellent um, summation of all the issues. And I, yeah, delimitation is going to be a big issue uh, going forward for sure. Um, we I, we have um, a few questions in, some of them you've already answered actually. So I'll lead with one. We'll, we'll start with uh, Milan. It, what do you see as the implications of these elections um, for US-India uh, relations uh, going forward? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, it, it's hard to sort of say anything that's that earth shattering here. Uh, I mean, clearly, I think as, uh, as Sadhanam just mentioned, uh, the the BJP led NDA 
occupies a very clear poll position headed into the 2024 general elections. Um, you know, this uh, this is not new. If you look, for instance, at the India Today Mood of the Nation poll back all the way till you know 2016, um, just as a it's a biannual poll, uh, uh, you know, they have shown repeatedly over that time that the NDA, if elections were held today, uh, would win a majority, right? But I think that that feeling is is enhanced due to these results. Um, so I think we can expect sort of broad consistency in terms of government dynamics, in terms of how this government for, works, which of course is much more centralized than say the Congress government uh, of Manmohan Singh. Um, so, but with some changes in personnel, uh, likely, right? I mean, we've had uh, uh, many ministers who have been around now for 10 years. Um, the, the BJP has a stated policy of kind of a retirement age and then moving people off um, to a, a kind of an elders council and bringing new people in. So we're likely to see that. I think, um, look, this renewed mandate also is is potentially going to make some big changes possible, right? Um, I think that the, the two big things that often get mentioned that have, have been on the sort of BJP agenda, one more recently and one uh, for quite a long time, uh the the age old issue is of course a, a uniform civil code which is um uh finally doing away after seven decades with religion or faith specific personal laws uh, and instead having a uniform civil code that applies to all indians um and that is something that where the politics are very very interesting actually because many liberals would support this and in fact the constitution states that the state should endeavor towards bringing about a uniform civil code, I think where there is some uh, concern or some anxiety is whether or not that will be a kind of an impartial technocratic exercise or whether that will be a uniform civil code with sort of Hindu characteristics, right? Um, but I think the politics are very interesting because, uh, but because many liberals agree in principle that this would be a good thing to do. This is along with the abrogation of Article 370 and the, the construction of the Ram Mandir and Ayodhya been one of the top three BJP manifesto items for many years. Uh, and the second is one nation, one election. Uh, and the idea is to do away with this uh, staggered calendar of state and national elections. Uh, and actually unify them or align them. Um, this was the subject of a government uh, report several years ago. Uh, it is now the subject of a high-level committee that's being chaired by the former Indian president, Ramnath Govind. Um, also very controversial, as you might imagine, because if you were to align state and national elections, um, there's reason to believe that this is going to benefit the BJP because they could the BJP could contest these state polls on the backs of Mr. Modi, who, of course, as Sanana mentioned, is, is is far and away the most popular leader, leader in India and perhaps in the democratic world, right? Um, that's not something that's going to happen, I don't think, in time for April, May 2024, although it could be something uh, that they, they promised if they're brought back to power, right? Um, and the last thing I would say in terms of the trajectory of U.S.-India relations is, you know, I think we are we have started to see the signs of what I've called kind of creative destruction among the opposition. The opposition is no longer taking for granted, and I think hasn't for several years now, that that the Congress um, has to be the leader of some kind of opposition coalition. Um, we are seeing different claimants to power try to flex their muscles. And I expect that that sort of jockeying is only going to intensify, which in the short term is going to mean, frankly, probably a lot of opposition disarray uh, until someone uh, sort of comes on top or unless and until the Congress is able to sort of get its house in order. Right. So I think broad consistency um, uh, with a few nuances. Yeah, that's um, very insightful. Thank you. Uh, Bufana. I'm going to ask you the same question, but for the point of view of policies. I mean, you mentioned you thought it would be easier to to take some some risks on policy now. You know, which of those might affect uh, U.S. and actually any you know foreign uh, investor in in India? Uh, in some ways, everything is broken, and still it runs here, right? So, uh, wherever you begin is is great. Uh, but I feel there are three big issues uh, where 
one action is needed and two perhaps there is an opportunity to act and the first is the sort of age-old question of um, is India too rigid on its labor protection framework right interestingly the previous uh, BJP government in Rajasthan was sort of the first mover on this across India at least in the last two decades if you will right so if you recall in 2014 they had taken some measures to liberalize uh, the industrial disputes act the factories act and so on and so forth uh, and um, once the um, 2018 government came into power uh, 2019 government came into power there was some talk of new labor codes which are, which have since then been suspended in animation so my sense is that the first big issue that states would want to move on well they ought to move on that's my wish list for them is uh, labor regulation and starting to allow uh, firms to enter into more consenting relationships with workers, uh, whether it is on working hours, whether it is on compensation, whether it is on women's uh, employment at night, on various factory processes, and so on and so forth. Um, and this has uh, big implications for the China plus one, uh, you know, sort of uh, framing that is uh, that is, is quite prevalent today, right? If you want to upseat China as a manufacturing center, you will have to do some of these things. Um, and the question is, who will go first and what will happen? Interestingly, Karnataka in the last few years was the one that went first. Uh, under the BJP government and when the government changed, there was a lot of conversation of reversal, uh, but there was no reversal. And this government just uh, notified uh, that particular law, right, to, to everybody's surprise. Um, and this question is very much on the cards. You're seeing states make moves. So that will be the first. And in some ways that will, in Madhya Pradesh, it will be interesting to see if it happens because it was the seat uh, of the 1984 Bhopal gas tragedy, right? And since then, which in fact led to a lot of the ossification of uh, labor regulation in India in some ways. Um, so that's one area of work. The second is land use uh, in different ways. The first is, of course, the buying and selling of land, whether it's land acquisition, uh, whether it is transfer of land, um, repurposing land from agricultural use to industrial use, residential use, and so on. And this sort of dovetails into several different things. First, across India and across states, there is a big emphasis on urbanization, which is building better planned cities, more inclusive cities, smart cities, so on and so forth. And second, there is a big emphasis on infrastructure. Both of these, uh, you know, sort of dreams in some way will require uh, figuring out how to repurpose land, how to make transfer ownership, clarity of land, how to, um, you know, sort of allow for people to be able to enter into different kind of uh, leasing arrangements, if you will, with land and so on. The second part of land use is once you've repurposed the land, the state also determined how much of it you can build on. So how tall you can build, how you know how much of space you have to leave and so on and so forth. Uh, and this has big ramifications because ultimately it's about productivity, right? It's about uh, being able to assign capital to the most productive use. So land and labor, I feel, are the two issues where uh, there is an opportunity to be able to make corrections. Uh, the three or four subsequent issues, transport, We've been talking a lot in India about how do you create supply chains when transport, warehousing, logistics are broken. Um, and interestingly, all of the states that have gone into elections have released a warehousing and logistics policy, right, in the last one year or so. Uh, and so you know that it's on people's minds. Um, but along with this, there is the question of transport and how do you allow trucking liberalization? Because trucks can't move uh, freely across India. There is, uh, you know, sort of a fair amount of unionization. There are price controls and so on and so forth. And how will you break that? Uh, where will you begin? Because it's not an easy battle to, to pick. I feel like if you've got to focus on the economic growth agenda, these are three big questions. And simultaneously doing something about agriculture, making it easier for people to shift out of agriculture. And this is a tricky one because revealed preferences say one thing, but stated preferences say an entirely different thing in, insofar as agriculture goes, right? How um, a political party, how a political leader reconciles these two, uh, I don't know, which is perhaps I am, why I am not in politics. <laughs> well, thank you. Um... Uh, I would just add, you know, in terms of U.S.-India relations, I don't know if you agree, but the what you had mentioned before about the cheap electricity is going to make it even more challenging to meet climate change goals. Um, 
in future. But... Absolutely. And interestingly, all of the states have renewables policies. They have targets around this. They've got the uh, carbon substitution is on everybody's mind, right? But along with a broken electricity framework, how are you going to reconcile all of this? Again, pending questions, I imagine. Um, well, thank you. That was excellent. Um, and we have time for one more question. I think. Can I, Catherine? Can I quickly just jump in on? I want to. Oh, please, yes. Of both of those. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll be I'll be super short. Tele Indian television style, but without yelling at people. Hopefully. I was um, going to ask for that. Yeah. Um. So. Um, very quickly, right on the sort of if you, if you sort of look at the look at you know U.S. India relations, um, I would say that continuity on the whole is good for the relationship. Uh, and if you were to but if you were to kind of break it up into sort of three parts, and if you were to look at the sort of the strategic relationship, that has clearly been on a very firm footing um, on Mr. Modi's watch, and you know I imagine that to continue, uh, notwithstanding sort of you know recent kerfuffles. Um, around the Panoon case and so on. I imagine that the strategic relationship uh, is going to continue to deepen. Both sides cl seem clearly committed to that, and they both seem to be taking great care to ensure that that remains on the rails. The economic question is kind of interesting to me. I sort of, you know, to take a more, you know, macro view, I think if the B I'm assuming here that the BJP comes back again with a single party majority, um, it would be a uh, uh, a vote of confidence for, uh, you know, a departure from what was the regular liberalization template that we had seen until 2014 uh, in two major ways. Uh, the first, of course, is the retreat from global trade, India not wanting to, India retreating from the, from, from, from RCEP, raising tariffs and so on. And secondly, um, which has been the second part of it, which has been the, the, the use of these uh, production linked incentives, to attract investment, both domestic and foreign, and also the kind of uh, bid to build national champions, a kind of East Asian style thing. Now, I think the interesting thing from a US-India perspective there would be the degree to which that creates frictions and the degree to which India is able to grow its economy sufficiently and to give American companies a sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, slice of the pie for that to be a net positive and not to become a, a sticking point. Um, and the final question, which of course no one, no one, no one has has touched upon, but maybe because we haven't had time in this chat. Um, I think on the question of uh, you know human rights, civil liberties, and that whole you know ba basket of issues where we've seen a lot of tensions, uh, a lot depends on what a third Modi term will look like. Um, are we going to see a doubling down and a deepening of or what you might term as hardline Hindu nationalism or hardline Hindutva? Or would Modi in his third term kind of seek to uh, cement his international legacy and uh, perhaps sort of, you know, uh, step back on some of some of the more sort of contentious uh, programs and pronouncements that one sees, sees from his party. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. I think it could go um, it, it, it could go either way. But I think that is um, either way most likely continue, you know, likely to continue to be something that sort of contributes to tensions in the U.S.-India relationship, um, albeit not tensions that are, you know, rise to a level where they are able to overpower uh, the very real and concrete gains on the strategic side of the relationship. Well, thank you. And you actually sort of predicted what I was going to ask is the last question, which is what the BJP would campaign on, um, you know, going forward. But I think you've, you've answered it very well. I'm just going to give, we're actually out of time, but I'm just going to give uh, all three of you a, a chance to make any closing uh, remark that you might want to make. I don't have any closing remarks. Those are my closing remarks. Okay. <laughs> Milan Bhuvan. Yeah, uh, may maybe I'll just try to very quickly uh, just respond to to two of the questions that I saw in my in, in 60 seconds. The first is uh, about, you know, if everyone's providing welfare. Why do people support the PJP? Uh, I just refer people to a, a interesting column by Nilanjan Sarkar in the Hindustan Times. Uh, and basically, he sort of put forward three arguments, right? One is that uh, unlike the Modi and the BJP, the Congress has not necessarily shown a long-term commitment to female voters. And I think this is going to be a factor we're going to hear a lot about because some of the evidence we have from these elections suggest that um, that women really did favor the BJP relative to Congress. And that is a newish trend in the Modi era. Um, there has always been a deficit, gender deficit, 
facing the BJP, and that has now completely reversed. The second is that, um, you know, and, and related is that Modi has really uh, persistently tried to build support uh, among women, including uh, finding ways to expand how the BJP mobilizes female voters through kind of female party activists, right? Um, uh, and, and last but not least, you know, they, they have a, a ability because of the Sangh Parivar to, uh, in parallel with state delivery, to have a kind of marketing and promotion kind of arm that can make sure that people realize that benefits are coming directly from the prime minister. Uh, just let me just end by saying on the question on the Congress, um, I, you know, I just want to, uh, whether or not they need new leaders, let me just quote something that um, uh, uh, Roshan Kishore had in his column today, which is saying that, uh, you know, going forward, the lessons of these elections is that the Congress should shun political nihilists whose engagement with politics, crudely speaking, is comparable to disenfranchised socialites and their political stakes are next to zero. They should be avoided like the plague. Um, so I think that Ouch. tells you something <laughs> a little bit about where people see the, the Congress satraps. Um, I, I want to emphasize that we are neutral, <laughs> all of us on these issues. Um, Thank you all so much. I wish we had more time, including to discuss the future of the small or regional parties, you know, 54 of them that really normally play the role of kingmaker. And I think uh, some of the results out of these elections, you know, throw some of that in question as well. But that'll be for the next uh, the next session. Um, meanwhile, thank you so much uh, for your excellent presentations and for reminding us all why Indian state politics really do matter, both for India's trajectory and for uh, its relations with the United States and others. Thank you so much. Have a good day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye.